All right, so a um, little bit about my lecture. So uh, I have a PowerPoint each time. And although you can't see it on the first slide, there, are, there in general will be notes on each slide as you get into the talk. So uh, for example, all the attributions, you know, the who did the work being referred to, that in my slides will generally be down here in the notes in the PowerPoint presentation. Also, on the, uh, on the schedule, when you click on this lecture, the menu comes up, there'll be this PowerPoint, but there'll also be a PDF, which is a chapter or a set of couple chapters from a book I'm writing. Uh, they're a little bit out of date. Uh, I'm still revising, and there are plenty of typos. But they do give a written account of each of these lectures. And so uh, for this lecture, for example, uh, you'll, there, there are two such sets of notes. And the response to selection part of this lecture is in at the end of the second set of notes. I reshuffled the order. Um, OK, so now guess what? I'm going to be redundant on Joe's talk. But I think that's a good thing. Because even if you're familiar with this stuff, I've, I like to listen to Joe, even though I've heard this many times, because he has a different perspective. I'm going to go over exactly the same material with a slightly different perspective. And guess what Pat's going to do? <laughs> so we're, <laughs> we're going to drill, drill, drill on these basic concepts of quantitative genetics today. I think we're going to be, are you going to be univariate, or are you going to go to multiple traits? I was just going to do uh, univariate. You're going to, OK, so this is. Today is our univariate day, and we're with, with plenty of redundancy. Tomorrow, we're going to go multivariate. Uh, that is to say, we're going to deal with multiple traits. Now, part of the reason for me covering much of the same material as Joe is I'm going to use a different notation. I'm going to use Landy, Russ Landy type notation, and then I'll use that in the multivariate lecture tomorrow and on through the other lectures that I'll give. And uh, maybe some of the other lectures will use that notation as well. OK, what about your? Where'd Joe go? I need a pointer. He ran off with it. You see? I've got one. Oh, it's under the thing. I didn't see it. Okay, good for you. All right. OK, so here we are. Uh, we're going to talk about the inheritance of, this, of, a, of a single trait and selection. And here I've got a little icon uh, at the start of this. I think these are, this is the only animal picture I have. And this picture is to remind me of a particular point that Joe made. And that is, much of quantitative genetics was made, in, developed in a plant and animal breeding sphere. And so this, this reminds us of Jay Lush and the other practitioners of quantitative genetics who used this theory to uh, improve animal and plant stocks. Uh, and I'm remembering, too, that I, I originally used this slide in a lecture because Charlie Smith, a quantitative geneticist in uh, Scotland years ago, several decades back, calculated that the annual improvement in the, in the fat back of the British swine herd was worth 10 million pounds. So the plant and animal breeders are often interested in the economic. We're going to talk about delta Z bar equals R, that response to selection. Plant and animal breeders are interested in that because your company, your, your country, can put a monetary value on that, that response to selection. And it's often appreciable. Even just the, the per generation change. OK. OK, so here's our thesis for the lecture today. Uh, Joe talked about the bridge from, from uh, a single locus to many loci to, to many genes. And we're interested in this topic of polygenic inheritance because many traits are affected by many genes, and not all but many traits, and often the very ones that we're most interested in, for example, life history traits. Uh, picking up the theme from last time and continuing on through the course, we're going we're to focus on the fact that we can model inheritance, like so many other things we'll talk about, with a statistical approach, with statistical models. Dropping out of that statistical approach is this idea that a particular kind of genetic variance, in particular additive genetic variance, is the concept that enables us to model both inheritance and response to selection. And that's our big takeaway message from today. Not VD, 
which in this class is dominant experience, <laughs> but VA, additive genetic variance. Okay, and here's an outline of what we're going to do. I, as I said, we're going to parallel, we're going to follow Joe's uh, outline pretty closely. We're going to look at the concept of phenotypic resemblance between parents and offspring. Uh, we're going to make the point that we need a model. We're going to present that model. We'll look at a couple of examples. We are going to stop and ponder why we don't run out of additive genetic variants. I've had colleagues ask me about this, and uh, I have to remind them that mutation is, a, is an ongoing thing. So that's the point we're going to make there. And then finally, we're going to end up with response to selection, uh, how the trait means changes under particular selection regimes. Okay, so you saw a picture of Francis Galton. Here's a, this is a slightly reworked version of Galton's plot. As an example, in his book in 1889, Francis Galton talked about the inheritance of body stature, height and in inches, in the British human population. And Galton pioneered plots of this kind, in which he plotted the average height of parents, that is to say, but the average height or mid-parent height means the average of mom and dad. Against, and against that he plotted the height of offspring, the average of all the sons or the average of all the daughters, or maybe the average of both. But here I think we're looking at, we're looking at the average of all the offspring. And what Galton observed was that you often got, you often got a cloud that had a non-zero slope. Remember, this is 1889. This was big news. And Galton established this kind of relationship for many kinds of characters, traits, and humans. And it's, uh, it's a newsy thing to think about. Now, here are the concepts that Galton, Galton applied to this. Uh, first of all, if we looked at perfect inheritance, that would be the, the slope that right, goes right through the middle of the cloud with a slope of 1. That's shown in the dotted line. And what Galton said is, if I, if I do a least squares regression, which was something available from Gauss at that point, if I do a least squares regression, it has a lesser slope than perfect inheritance. And what that means is that if you've got parents that are bigger than average, their offspring regress back towards the mean. And if you've got parents that are smaller than average, their offspring regress upwards towards the mean. And I'm using the word regress on purpose because this was the uh, this was the the book in which and the set of papers in which the concept of regre the, the the term regression was applied to this least squared line. So uh, quantitative genetics lives with us. If you this is so we, we didn't have quantitative genetics then, but uh, the term regression comes from this application. Okay, so uh, so that's all all Galton did, but it was a lot at the time to show that this kind of resemblance between parents and offspring for different kinds of traits was extremely common, not only for height, but for musical ability and lots of other things. Okay, what about a model for phenotypic resemblance? As Joe pointed out, this came later, not just from Fisher, but also from Wright and from Weinberg. And let's just recap what, what Joe was saying earlier. Uh, this is from an earlier version of Joe's lecture, and here's the model, phenotypic value. Uh, we look at contributions to the mean from, what, four different loci, and also from a, uh, an environmental effect. Sorry? A through E. A through E. Four loci plus an environmental contribution. Am I counting right? We're quantitative biologists. We can see that. <laughs> One, two, three, four plus a fifth from environmental effect. Oh, 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 you're right. Okay. <laughs> okay, this is why we have to keep track of each other, particularly you have to keep track. This yes, you're right. You are, like. <laughs> that's very ch charitable uh, interpretation. Yes, five loci plus a draw from a, a random normal distribution of random genetic effects. Boy, I can feel the jet lag as I try and stand up here. Okay, so... Um, now, Joe showed you uh, a lot of algebra in which we laid out a model in which we had the contributions from each of these loci. What we're going to do is collect all of those per locus effects into a single value that we're going to call the genetic value for the trait. And here we have, I'm gonna, in, in the model I'm going to use here, 
I'm going to leave out the dominance contributions, and I'm going to be summing up just the additive contributions from each of the loci. In other words, we have to go through and do that, that regression technique that Fisher pioneered. And if we did that, then we would have the phenotypic value in a simplified model without dominance composed of an additive genetic value and an environmental value. Now guess what the breeders call X, this sum across loci of the additive effects. You can almost guess. They call it breeding value, right? Because it's the value of an individual with phenotype Z. If we knew its breeding value, we'd know what its contribution would be to the next generation. And breeders actually go out uh, and and estimate the breeding value sometime of their stock. So for example, if you're a cattle breeder, you actually advertise the breeding value of, your, of the stock whose sperm you were selling for, for AI. And you get that breeding by, value by breeding that sire to a large number of females called dams and taking the average of all of the progeny produced from all of those dams. And you have to do it. There's a scalar correction. But that gives you, and you actually advertise the breeding value Here's the contribution of this. Here's the, the likely improvement you will see in your stock by buying the sperm from this bull. So this is something you could, act, if you wanted to, you could, actually, you could actually estimate. We're dealing with a simplified model from now on in which we're assuming that there's no covariance between breeding values and, 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 uh, and environmental effects. So when we go to means and when we go to variances and, and covariances or variances uh, in this final row, there's no, there's no extra terms. There's no covariance term. We've got a totally, totally additive model. Uh, so note the change in, in, in notation, what Joe called P, realistically, for phenotype, phenotypic value. We're going to call Z, following Landy. P is going to mean the phenotypic variance of the trait. G is going to mean the additive genetic variance of the trait. And E is going to be the environmental variance for the trait. So G is a variance. What is, it, what is it, it a variance of? Breeding value. Okay. Yeah. Can somebody grab me a drink of water back there? Is there a... Pat, I'll do this for you if you'll do it for me. Yeah, it, there, here's the switch. I'm, I put the switch on. There's some delay. Oh, you're right. Where's the good mic? Right, anyway, I'll shout. Bye. Okay, uh, shout. Yeah. Uh, I'm a little confused by your presentation here. Is X the sum of the additive contributions, or is it the sum of the genetic contribution, which includes the dominance deviations? Down below, you have G as, it sounds like it's the, the, the genetic contribution. No. So X is going to be the, the sum of just the additive effects. So the E is not the environmental effect, it's the non-additive. We're going to assume no, no, we're going to assume no dominance, if you like. You could, you could throw everything into the environmental okay. term if you want. You want to do that? Fine. Okay. But, so the important part for us is X is going to be breeding value or additive genetic value with variance G. OK. So also, uh, if we now, we also have a new perspective on Galton's regression. So if, if ZO is a random variable, the offspring, the mid-offspring mid value, and now Z of P is, so we've changed notation again, now T is the denoting mid-parent. If we look at that covariance, that, as Joe showed in his lecture, that covariance, it comes down to a covariance between the two breeding values of offspring and parents because there's no, there's no shared, we're assuming there's no shared environmental contribution to the, the phenotype, right? So if we take the covariance of, Z, of these two Zs, that's equivalent to the covariance of these two Xs. And what is that covariance? That's a covariance of X with X. That's the same as the genetic variance, the, uh, the variance in breeding values. Now you'll see later why I'm writing things with this form with p to the minus 1. In the univariate, we'll, we'll see that when we we'll look at this form and think about it when we go to multiple traits. But for right now, it's equivalent to genetic variance divided by 
phenotypic variance, and that's what we're calling heritability. And so in the mid-parent case, that h squared is the slope of the resemblance line, the, the least squared line that, uh, that uh, Galton was drawing. Okay, and our model identifies g then as the covariance that's responsible for that, that slope that key Galton observation. Okay, so Joe also talked about this. What about resemblance between other kinds of relatives? So here you can see what I'm doing, Joe. Let's expand our model so that we have dominance and we have epistasis. What we've done here, though, just as a shortcut, is just as x is the sum over loci of additive effects, here little d is going to be the sum over loci of the dominance deviations from that kind of regression approach that Joe talked about. And then here, epistasis, the I terms are going to be the sum over pairs and triplets of loci, so that we're summing all of those effects. And here we see we could actually, we could actually decompose that I sum, this is for an individual now, into additive by additive contributions, additive by dominance contributions, dominance by dominance, and here this is the this is the sum of all three-way interactions between the additive effects at, at loci, at all loci. Okay, so if you think back, what Fisher was doing, Wright, Weinberg as well, was calculating the covariance between pairs of relatives under this model. What if we include the epistasis term? Now that, that expanded model was independently explored by two people, Clark Cockerham uh, in 1954, and about the same time by Oscar Kempthorne, and they both came up. This is this is Cockerham's version. Now Joe also showed you this this equation. I think I guess you showed the whole thing, but this no, is no, I didn't, I didn't you didn't have epistasis. I mentioned, I mentioned it. I yeah, didn't show it. you didn't show you didn't show it with epistasis. So the, and, and indeed, this is this is sort of a shortcut version because we're collapsing, we're collecting all the epistatic terms into into you know, additive by additive, additive by dominance, and so forth. But here what you see is a general expression for the covariance between any kind of relatives. You've got two kinds of relatives, x and y. What is that? They might be, they might be full sibs. They might be nephews and nieces. It, it could be anything you want. And here we have, from Kempthorne and, and, and especially from Cockerham, a general expression for those covariances. Um, so. We're going to focus on the parent offspring resemblance, that covariance. And why is that? Because we're primarily going to be using the resemblance between parents and offspring to model responses to selection and also drift from one generation to the next. For that, we just need the parent offspring transition from one generation to the next. And so if we look at this model for parents and offspring, we have to look at our coefficients. This is what Joe is calling F1. It's a coefficient of relationship. U is what Joe called F2. I guess that's a coefficient of co-ancestry. Um, I can't I remember what it's called. called. We yeah. always ask each other this. One of us. It's the coefficient you use put in front of the dominance variance. That's all I know. <laughs> it is the probability that two alleles is the probability that two alleles at different loci are identical by descent in relatives x and y, whereas r is the probability that an allele at a particular locus is identical by descent in relatives x and y. Okay, so this has to do with uh, the transmission of genotypes. This has to do with the transmission of two locus genotypes. This with the transmission of alleles. So if we look at parents and offspring, u is zero for, par for parents and offspring. And just look at the first three terms. We have R times G, where this is one half, if we've got one parent. And the contribution by, from additive to by additive epistasis is R to the square. So that would be one quarter. And if we go out and look at this contribution, that's one half to the third power. To the fourth power, it's R, R fourth and so forth. So you can truncate this series probably because you see you're going to probably have terms of div diminishing magnitude here. All right, so um, when we calculate heritability, taking Galton's approach, 
we're necessarily going to have this term and this term, right? And you could worry about any other term. That's going to be zero, that's zero. You're going to have this term, you're going to have that term's going to be, this whole term's going to be zero, this is going to be zero, and so forth and so forth. Okay, oh, there's my water. Thank you, Pat. Okay. Um, now, if you're interested in, in these other terms, so G is, is going to be the primary thing responsible for, for predicting what drift does from one generation to the next, if, and, and likewise for response to selection. If you're interested in dominance variance and the other apostatic terms, then you're probably going to have to do some breeding design. You've got an equation with, with, un, with some number of unknowns. And a general rule is you need as many equations as you have unknowns to solve for those quantities. And so how would you get those additional equations? Well, you'd have to have different combinations of relatives. And you'd have to have as many combinations as you have unknowns that you want to solve for over here. OK, so here's my point. As we go forward into the course into an evolutionary consequence, into evolutionary consequences, we're just going to be interested in additive genetic variants. And we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about epistatic components to that, to our estimation, uh, tomorrow in Adam Jones' lecture. I think that's tomorrow. Yeah, Katie? No. So, Katie said the terms go to zero if there's no epistasis. No. So U is the probability that two alleles, that two alleles at different loci are identical by descent in two, the two relatives we're looking at. So in parents and offspring, U is equal to zero. And as a consequence, this whole term becomes zero. You can multiply anything, and likewise, this whole term is zero, and so is that one, and so on this one, and, and, and right on out. The only terms that you're going to contribute from epistasis are additive by additive terms. And um, anyway, their magnitude and contribution to parent offspring resemblance is probably small. I think everybody still thinks that, but you have to think. But epistasis and the evolution, epistasis makes important uh, contributions to the evolution of G, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that at Adam Jones' talk. So we, we don't want to sweep epistasis under the rug, but it's not something we have to, we have to wring our hands over. I'm remembering a, a term that I learned from Giannis Antonovich. We're going to pursue genetics without tears. We're not going to cry over violations of assumptions. We're looking for a model that's useful, even if it's not exactly right. We're not gonna we're not gonna sit and weep in our rooms because because of epistasis and maternal effects. We're gonna go boldly forward. All right, let's look at a couple of examples. Um, uh, we're gonna use garter snake examples in a couple of my uh, computer exercises. Here, for example, is a, a, a nature scene snake, not a garter snake, but a, a, a garter snake looks like this when you x-ray them, and you can count the number of vertebrae in the body by looking for ribs, and you can see from that that the, the body ends right about there. So counting all of these ribs, all of these vertebrae would tell you the number of body vertebrae, and then you can count the number of tail vertebrae as well. Fortunately, uh, the, the vertebrae are denoted on the other side, underside of the snake by by those big ventral scales, so you don't even have to do an x-ray, you can just count those scales and you can get the two vertebral counts. Here's a distribution of vertebral counts, and you can see if that's not normal, it's pretty close to normal. At least it's very unimodal. And so we can this is the body vertebral count. If we do that for the tail vertebral count, uh, you, you see a similar distribution. And we're going to do a computer exercise this afternoon in which we try and estimate the heritability of this body, uh, and I think we're going to do the tail vertebral count, some other counts as well, uh, uh, with parent offspring regression. We're going to have one parent, we're going to have mom, and we're going to have the vertebral counts of her daughters. And why are we doing mothers and daughters? Well, there's sexual dimorphism. So if we just look at within a sex, we, can, we don't have to worry about that. 
irritating complication. We're not going to cry about it. We're going to find a way around it and go forward. All right, and here we're going to do those two. Here are those two plots. So here's the mom's body count. Body count. That's the number of body vertebrae. And here is the average of her daughters. So that's the mid-daughter count. And uh, the slope of this line is what? What did we learn in Joe's lecture? It's half the heritability. So we need to take that slope and multiply it by 2. We'll do that in our computer exercise. And when we do that, we get a heritability estimate of 54% for body vertebrae and similar number, 48% for, uh, for the tail vertebrae. Just an example. Now, not surprisingly, when did we first start estimating heritability? Wow, probably, probably in the 30s. So Jay Lush is publishing his book in 1937. People had been at work since 1918 doing a lot of estimates. And today, by today, we have Derek Roth, who compiled the survey, had no trouble finding nearly 600 estimates of heritability for morphological characters. So here I'm showing you the entire, the entire literature, a big sample of the literature. And if you look at this, when we go forward and, and want to model the evolution of morphological traits, what would be a reasonable heritability estimate to take? I, I'm going to use 0.4, which is pretty close to the mode of this distribution. And you can see that the estimates go even out beyond 1, and they go out, they go below 0. How can that happen? How could you get an estimate greater than 1? Yeah. Welcome to the world of variance components, right? So the point estimates, the point estimates can be outside of the parameter boundaries, and so a single value is not so is is of interest, but we also want to know what its its sampling properties are and we could we might be able to encapsulate those with with uh, with confidence limits, you could make an assumption of normality and, and calculate a sampling interval for, on that basis. What we're going to show you in the computer exercise right after this is a way to do it with bootstrapping. So let's talk about bootstrapping just for a minute since I mentioned it. How many of you know what bootstrapping is? Not every... Okay, so we'll talk about it a little bit more later. I'm trying to remember Efron's first name, Joe. What? Bradley. Bradley Efron. Bootstrapping, jackknifing. Maybe not his biggest hits, but they're pretty big, aren't they? I think bootstrapping is his. Jackknifing is not? Jackknifing was already around. Really? Wow, I'm taking Efron down a notch. <laughs> All right, now we're on our fourth topic. We're going to talk next time about selection. So selection, uh, selection is going to, is going to, as we're going to see in a minute, can be thought of as nibbling away at that distribution of uh, distribution of uh, phenotypic and hence uh, genetic values. I mean, after all, you're, you're looking at a, a subset of the individuals with respect to this character reproducing and producing offspring each generation. Why don't we just lose all genetic variants for traits? Well, there's an additional source of, of input, uh, and that's mutation. Uh, so uh, a lot of work has been, uh, has been done to look at the effects of stabilizing selection and mutation and how much genetic variation you could maintain in a quantitative trait uh, under a scheme of mutational input and stabilizing selection. Now, why, does, why is mutation thought to be capable or almost capable of balancing the losses from stabilizing selection. Well, mutation isn't happening at every locus every generation, but for a lot of these traits that we're talking about, we've got a lot of loci, so the potential input from mutation could be very large. This is Russ Landy's model. Here we see uh, hidden variation being shuffled between stabilizing selection, helping to create it, and the combination helping to undo it, and so there's a, there's a shuttling between express variation and, and variation that's bound up in link, linkage disequilibrium. This is under a model of uh, mutation selection balance with uh, stabilizing selection. 
Now, in the real world, things are more complicated. And if we include migration as a source of, uh, of variation and loss by drift, so in the previous model, we were thinking about a, a population of infinite size. If we've got a population of finite size, then we've got this rather more complicated model. But with all of these factors, it's not too much of a surprise that we, 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 we can account for observed levels with, with uh, a model like this. Um, and this kind of an argument is our basis for saying that when we observe a particular heritage, uh, genetic variance in a population, we might also be looking at an equilibrated value that's maintained over long stretches of evolutionary time. And we're going to take the very strong version of that. We're going to imagine that our G uh, estimate is going to be constant because of this mutation selection balance on very long time scales arguing that our pattern of stabilizing selection and our pattern of uh, mutation and maybe our pattern of migration uh, are going to be long time, uh, if not constants, relatively stable. Okay, so I'm streaming along. I'm actually going to get us back on time here, uh, or pretty close to it. Let's look at the, our final topic, changing the trait mean with selection. I'm going to go over the same ground that Joe went over in a slightly different way. So an easy way to think about this so we don't have this factor of half is imagine our plot of mid-parent values and offspring. Those are actually mid-offspring values. So the slope of this overall regression with everybody in the population is h squared. Right? This is the average of both parents. This is the average of all the offspring by that particular pair of parents with that mid-parent mid, uh, value. All right, now we're going to do thought experiment. Let's imagine we perform truncation selection. Truncation selection is going to be applied such that all of the individuals above this point, I guess I might have used 0.05. You can see in the, in the, in the, in the slide label and certainly in the notes what, what it looks like, 0.5. And so we're going to imagine that only the individuals in black become the parents of the next generation. Now let me just anticipate our lecture tomorrow in which we talk about selection. This kind of select truncation selection is presupposes that there's some relationship between fitness in the population and trait value. What is that function in this case? Step it's a step function, isn't it? Zero fitness here, and then at 0.05, your fitness suddenly drops, jumps up to some value. So that's our fitness function, and we're going to be talking a lot about fitness functions later. The concept that I'm going to talk about of taking the average of all of the individuals after selection, that concept applies whether we have truncation selection or any other form of any other fitness function operating on the population. Okay, but so that's our generalization. But let's back up and just think. So these are going to think of these as perhaps survivors, and we have, we have two classes of individuals here. We have those that do not survive and those that survive. A natural thing would be to take the contrast between those, right? Between the blue and the black. Is that what we're going to do? My undergraduates do that about half the time, no matter what I tell them. It's sure a sure question to break the curve. We're not going to do that. We are going to take the contrast between all individuals and the sample after selection. So we're going to take the contrast before, between the sample before selection, that's everybody, and the sample after selection. And there's a statistical reason why we want to do that. But let's, let's just do it for now and we'll look at, look at why. Now we're going, to take, we're going to take all of the individuals, black and blue, and look at their mean, and we're going to call that z-bar from now on, at least in my lectures. And we're going to look at, contrast that with the mean of the sample after selection, and we're going to call that z-bar star. Can you see the asterisk there? And this difference is what we're going to call the selection differential. It's what Joe called the selection differential, right? And here's the expression for the selection differential, z-bar star minus z-bar. Also, very easy to forget for the exam whether it's z-bar minus z-bar star or z, we you know which way is it? 
An easy way to remember that is that if you want, if z bar star is the greater quantity, you want, you want this s to be positive, right? So that means you want to write the equation this way, z bar star minus z bar, right? So when you've got, when selection is for a larger value, your s is, is positive. All right, and here's, here's J. Lush's breeder's equation. Delta z bar, which Joe called, and, and Lush called the response, big R, and what Falconer and Falconer and McKay called, McKay called R, is we're going to call delta z bar, the change in means. And that's equal to the heritability times the selection differential, or h squared times the selection differential. Now this is going to turn out to be the general form that we can carry into the multivariate case. But for right now, we're just going to think about, we're going to just think about this as h squared. So um, Jay Lush used to talk about, in his book, about h squared being the fraction of the selection differential that's carried into the next generation. You're, 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 a, you're a hog breeder. You're interested, you're going to impose this much selection. How much of that potential improvement are you going to see in the next generation? You got to multiply it by h squared, and that'll give you the response to the selection. So it's sometimes good to think in terms of breeder, breeder mindset. All right. Uh, let's see. What else did I wanted to? What did I want to say here? I have a point about covariance, but I guess we're going to bring it up in the next lecture. Okay, so here we are. We're a couple slides away from the end today for this lecture. Let me go back and make this point. Let's go back here. How many generations of response is this? It's just one. What if we apply the same equation? We're going to shift the mean from here to here, and we're going to have a new plot. These off are going to go up to be parents and blah, 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 and we're going to do the equation again. If we wanted to estimate the total response over that first generation of selection and the second generation of selection, what would it be? If we did two generations of selection instead of just one, what would our total response be? No, we're gonna we're gonna look at not this is not this is the delta z bar for one generation. Now we're gonna repeat it and we're gonna do a second generation. Everything remains the same. No parameters are gonna change. Okay, so delta z bar one is gonna be equal to that. Delta z bar the next generation is gonna be that, and we're gonna add them up. And what will we get? Please. You can't be more jet lag than me. It's double. It's double. It's double. It's going to be 2 h squared. So the two generation response. So if we have t out here, telling us how many generations, and if we go out, if we just wanted to make a simple extrapolation, 100 generations of selection, multiply this by 100. So now, if I do a plot of total selection response as a function of number of generations, what is that going to look like? It's going, to go, it's going to go like that, and its slope is going to be h squared, right? OK, that we're, we're calculating, yeah? Sorry, in the, in the example you're saying, are you in the second generation, the cutoff point that you're choosing? Is it the same? Everything's the same. We just iterate the same parameters. Is it the same consideration or absolute value? We're just going to leave all the parameters the same. Well, I think the issue is, would you keep the cutoff Oh no 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 no. no 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 no! I'm gonna no no no! I'm gonna slide it up to the new mean, and I'm gonna go s units from there. Yeah, okay, good point. That's what I mean by keeping it the same. Okay. Are, are you decreeing that things like the heritability aren't changing? I am. I am. <laughs> it's just this. This is the beauty of being theoreticians, right? <laughs> Why? Because we say so, and it might involve some re assumptions, but you know, okay. So <laughs> So this, this is what we call the deterministic response to selection. It's what we expect in a population of large size, for example. Yeah? Would two generations of that type of selection be the same as one generation of applying 2x to the selection? 
Uh, I guess it would, yeah. But, but what you would have to do to achieve 2S isn't necessarily trivial. So you, you might have to select much harder to achieve 2S from a much smaller fraction if you're doing truncation selection. Now also, as breeders, we're probably imposing stronger selection than in nature. So we might worry about whether we're going to throw our system out of mutation selection or balance, right? We've got no migration. So, but remember, this is a Gedanken experiment. This is a thought experiment. It's just two, it's just T times H squared S. That's our deterministic response to selection for T generations, generalized from just a simple equation. Okay, so, and I'm going to show you that in a graph. Here it is right here with a heritability. Now, here's a smaller selection differential. It's 0.01. Now, always in my slides, I'm going to standardize phenotypic variance to 1, right? So then heritability is just 0.4. It's just, you know, a 40% of that 1. And the selection differential is now 1% of a phenotypic standard deviation. If the variance is 1, the, the standard deviation is 1. So that's really weak, isn't it? But if we do that for 400 generations, you can see the deterministic response will move the mean out here one and a half phenotypic standard deviations, even though we're doing it a hundredth, you know, the math is not hard, right? Now, what are all these other lines? These other lines are populations that are sampled with, from a population with a, 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 an effective size of 500. And so each generation, in addition to the deterministic response to selection from delta uh, z bar equals h squared s, we're going to add a random draw from a normal distribution of breeding values to represent drift, and we're going to give the rationalization for that later. But the point is, we're going to combine, we're going to find, combine stochasticity due to drift with the deter deterministic response, and we're going to think about many replicate uh, populations responding to the same selection each generation, but with a random draw of drift each generation. And so as time goes on, the response to selection has increasingly broad 95% confidence limits. But the point is, under a set of assumptions, normality of the original distribution being one of them, we can, we can calculate what those limits are. So even though we get, we get a response of, a deterministic response of one and a half, some of our populations actually lose ground, and some of them go out to three standard deviations of improvement, right? All right, guess what? This is the breeder's heartbreak, right? Because when you're doing selecting in the greenhouse and barnyard, you don't have the luxury of an infinite population size. And so you have, you, the breeder says, the experimentalists say, let's do replicate lines. So we can see what, what the effective size, which may be unknown in our, in our selected lines actually is doing to the response. So here's some long-term responses to bristle number in Drosophila. Ah, these are the number of bristles, abdominal bristles, in the upper slide on the abdomen. Now, it's actually just on one, one tergite, one of those bands, and it's like, I'm trying to think there, it's like there's two clusters of bristles like this, and you count them, and you get, you get in the base population something like 15. Sternal pleural bristles, I'm trying to remember where the sternal pleural plate is. It's up here in the shoulder, I think, right? You start out with a, a similar number there. Now, these two traits when you analyze them, have largely additive genetic variants. There's not much dominance. There's a little bit of epistasis involved. And you can see that the determined, the response to selection in replicate lines going up is, is steady, but not particularly dramatic. When you select down with the same selection differential, you go, you go down very rapidly. And maybe you're starting to plateau a little bit. But you can see, even after 200 generations, most of the lines still seem to be going up and down, right? So what does that mean, breeders? Still got genetic variation, right? You're still doing the same selection di differential generation after generation. You're still getting a response. It might be going down a little. It might be, you might have a scale problem, but you haven't got, you haven't lost all of your genetic variation. It might be attenuating a little bit. All right, I think that may be on my last slide.
and indeed it is. Okay, so here are our takeaway points. Uh, additive genetic variance, the key to understanding resemblance between parents and offspring. True for all intents and purposes. We've also talked about a little contribution from additive by additive epistasis. Uh, because of that, what gets us from one generation to the next? Well, that's parent-offspring resemblance, as, as Galton correctly pointed out. Uh, so it, G is also the key to modeling responses to selection. And next time we're going to talk about, because we're going from one generation, it's also the key for modeling drift in the absence of selection. Today, we are, uh, one of our point sub, subtexts is we don't have to think about drift and selection as alternatives. We can combine them into a single stochastic model, right? Then we've got selection combined with finite population size, and we get stochasticity. It's not like drift is something that we have to wish away. We can have it whenever we want it. Uh, and then we've also made this point that G is, as, as Jay Lush said, is nibbled away by selection, but restored in the next generation nibbled away by the selection differential or whatever form of selection, but restored by mutation the next generation, perhaps by migration as well. And here are some references. Um, uh, more general references that are appropriate here, uh, Joe gave in his reference list earlier on, so these are the ones that are more particular to particular results that I presented. 